are tuning in to watch the, the visual, not just the audio, but are here for the visuals. <laughs> it's literally just Kaylee posing on a sofa, very elegantly. This is what ring lights gets you folks. I actually heard on the radio the other day that there's like been a lot of study because everything is remote now about people and their self image and doctors are actually recommending people to get ring lights for Zoom meetings to feel better about themselves. Oh, you should have kept that as your one cool thing. <laughs> okay, and well, here we go. We'll circle back. <laughs> All right, well, now that I'm back with my ring light here, that's the only thing that I have that's been going on fancy. Ooh, you know what's fancy? I'm remembering we're supposed to do our intro. Hello, and we're totally not okay. That's not how it goes, but that's okay. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm Kaylee Legrand. <laughs> and I'm Justin Billy's so. I feel like it's close enough. It's closer than so many episodes. You know, mass media and the intersection of mental health and going crazy on TV. And that's basically how we do. I mean, it really is on TV now, right? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'm hi. Welcome back. Hello. Happy birthday, Tanya. You're out there in the universe. And for those of you who don't know her, she's the old host. And then I replaced her. The old host. <laughs> old on her old birthday how old is she? is she is she the same age as me right i love how i know she's like my don't, best say it out loud. don't say it out loud never reveal an actress's age no 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 we just do it relatively that's a word <laughs> she's my age ask my agent if you want to know yeah great can play a six-year-old or a 93 year old nothing in between <laughs> you're hired that's all he puts me out for <laughs> Uh, anyways, guys, I'm dope. real. I'm real excited about this episode because I'm treating it like a therapy session. Um, number one, I mean, let's just reiterate the fact. I was talking about this before we went live. Um, Justin said I looked cute, so I need to reiterate that, obviously. But I would also like to just be completely transparent and share <laughs> my response. I'm, first of all, not wearing a bra. Um, I went for a run the other day, forgot to put on a bra for that too. It's just been a lot of like reactionary lifestyle. I had this pent up anxiety and just ran out the door. Yes, I put running shoes on, but I have not been putting the bra on. I've showered and put deodorant on, but like, this is also, um, this is, <laughs> somebody mailed me this shirt from LA. It was a friend that I met on set and we just had, it was like a set of truth serum, which we, is what we were calling Jameson. And then when he got back, our cinematographer, great cinematographer, shout out to Rick Diaz, um, had a blast shooting with him. And he mailed me this shirt afterwards. So I'm living in this right now. How are you? Crushing it. I'm good. And I am ready for this week's guest. <sighs> yes, she has had her own podcast on our network, the Sonar Network, for quite some time. Uh, and I believe she's on a little bit of a hiatus right now, but I'm super excited to hear about that project for her and also just to chat with her because I've been wanting to for forever. So let's bring her on in. Hi. Hi, Katie. Oh. Hi, Justin. Hello. 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 Dina, who are you? How are you? Tell us things. <laughs> I'm great. I mean, living on a millionth lockdown as so many of us are but um you know staying sane as best as i can and i'm uh, i'm a stand-up comedian when when comedy was once a thing live comedy and i'm also a speaker a wellness speaker and i teach yoga and mindfulness so those are the things that i speak about and uh yeah thanks for the plug of the the podcast as well also have the ego podcast so that's kind of my little forte and I appreciate you guys having me on. We're super Glad excited. To have anytime. You. I remember, I think the last time that I saw you was at a yoga studio because yoga has been a big, big part of my life as well. Um, 
And that's, that's when we started chatting about wanting to connect and potentially hopping on each other's podcast. And I was super curious, especially because you have the word ego in the title of your podcast, that uh, Justin's reception is sometimes he's in the woods. So he'll hop on and off for those visual uh, watchers right now. But can you tell me what your podcast was about, essentially? Yeah, for sure. Also, I'm very jealous that you're in the woods, Justin, and would like to get some more detail on that because I would love to be in the woods right now. I've decided I'm going to trade in city life to be a tradeswoman. I'm going to pick up a trade. I don't know which one. I'm not, I'm not that handy, but I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to go to the woods. Maybe fishing. That's something I feel I could adjust to. But um, yeah, for sure. The Ego Podcast um, was a podcast about balance and I may bring it back but it was essentially a series of interviews where I would interview all different walks of life some people in the theater world some people in the um, the acting comedy world which you guys are familiar with and then some medical professional professionals both in the mental and physical health realms um, lawyers who teach mindfulness to other lawyers um, yoga instructors, and what they all had in common was that they practiced some form of meditation, mindfulness, or yoga, and that was kind of their home base. And so they spoke about why it made such a difference in their lives, and then that is really what led me into becoming a speaker. So I started off as a comedian just doing stand-up when I was doing that, and then I became so interested in it that it started to develop into these talks. And so actually that's become more my thing over the pandemic because I think a lot of us are looking for ways to, to work on our mental health, right? So that's kind of the story behind that. And it was just so cool getting to meet so many different people and kind of figuring out their little tricks and what they do. And uh, yeah, that's that's essentially what it was about. <laughs> I already have so many questions as far as what you have been up to over these isolating months, um, especially because you're also a comedian and uh, being a part of the circles in Toronto that we similarly run with improvisers and stand-up comedians and watching how they have traversed into this online world and pushed forward with their, their careers as comedians and their work online. Um, I am curious to get to that and I would like to hear about that, but it, it also sounds like you have of uh, a couple of other similar areas uh, that we play in as far as, you know, the, the mental health sectors and I'm a daily meditator um, and obviously being drawn to the word ego uh, and the kinds of talks that your conversations must encircle. I, I also want to know what your definition of an ego is because there are so many different understandings. And for me, I just, my mind already goes to like, I have a background in psychology, so there's obviously a differentiation between the Freudian understanding and then melding into Carl Jung and then think of like Eckhart Tolle who talks about the pain body. So what is an ego to you? Yeah, no, I love that. I like that you asked that. Um, and yeah, just to get into what I refer to it as on the podcast and just in my own understanding of it is quite far away from the Freudian definition. And it's mostly anything that separates us from each other, in my mind. That's kind of um, how I see ego. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing because some of the things that make us separate make us unique. We all kind of wear these different masks and we're like these different characters walking around. But I like to think that we're all kind of part of the same thing and we're just kind of wearing these outfits for a little while. <laughs> um, and so that's ego. And so remembering that I think, I mean, it sounds, maybe it sounds a little lame, but remembering that we're all connected in some way, but there is that difference. So ego is kind of really that separateness. So that's, that's what I went into it with. Um, and then, yeah, Kaylee is, you know, you know, in the comedy world and in entertainment in general, it's just full of ego. And so for my, <laughs> for myself who struggled with it a bit, a great deal, um, this has been a really good learning process for me. And Actually, since I started doing that podcast, a lot of my personal goals and career career goals have changed since I started really studying the ego and what what the good and the bad that comes with it. So, um, and I think I had one person on who she she had a great way of describing it. She's like, you know, the ego is like 
so tiny. Like if you actually looked at the size of it, like it's just like this little speck, but it has such a loud voice, like it can, right? So I like exploring it in that way. So yeah, I would say my definition is everything that kind of separates us and there's some beauty to that, but then there's also that co connectedness as well. So being able to be aware of that through that separation. Does that make sense? Makes it's sense. Okay. Yeah. I love that <laughs> definition. Sorry, go ahead, Dustin. No, you're good. I was just going to ask, um, basically, my understanding is that you're on hiatus right now with the podcast. And, and what prompted you to do that? What prompted you, like, obviously, you're growing throughout this experience, and maybe it no longer suits suits your needs, or it's just too demanding or something. But there tends to be a story behind it most of the time. And I mean, I know Kaylee and I, like, every time we're like scrounging up people and stuff too, like, it's a lot of work that goes into it that people don't realize. Um, but what was actually your motivation to kind of take a step away and have a little bit of a hiatus? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and so I would love to highlight that, like just all the work that you guys do in putting it together. It sounds really nice when you get to be the fly on the wall as the audience member, which is really wonderful. And you get to hear all these different conversations. Uh, but yeah, there is a lot of work that goes into it. And for me, um, just kind of going back to what I was saying about how my goals have changed, my career has changed a lot um, over the last couple of years. And so I got a lot of information from the podcast that I used in an initial talk that I started giving about wellness. And then that kind of grew. Nice. So, yeah. So then my focus now has been give has been giving these talks and it's been taking up a great deal of my time. So that's been the shift. So it wasn't anything negative about the podcast it was more just a time thing where i want to keep working on wellness and yeah. focus on that but putting that energy into speaking to groups now so it's almost like it's formed it came as gathering the information or the data so to speak and then um bringing it out what i've learned so that's kind of where do those was. where do you actually have those talks now that the pandemic is a thing like are you doing things virtually are you hosting things on youtube like wh what does that they're actually they're look all, like for you they're now? all in person they're the giant live events no no yeah they're definitely <laughs> <laughs> um, you're so confident about that i'm like oh no it's all at the an at the anti-mask rally. yeah they're an anti-mask rally a lot of people attend no uh they're all virtual tiny <laughs> egos <laughs> yeah tiny egos all together though, so loud. Uh, uh, no, they've all they've all been virtual, and they have. It's been I've been seem to be called to speak to a lot of schools at the moment. So a lot of colleges, universities in Canada and the U.S., and um, a lot of uh, companies like tech companies. A lot of companies that have come on to the virtual world. Um, there's been a huge grant through the Canadian government where they have more, they've given more uh, money and budget to a lot of companies and schools in particular for mental health resources. So these talks fall right in that. So it's it's um, shifted in that way. And yeah, it mo I seem to speak mostly to younger groups like students, interns that are starting at a new job, um, also groups who are, are adjusting to the big changes. And I guess maybe it took a pandemic for people to be like, hey, I need to really get on this mental health thing and how to take care of it. But I'm grateful because I, I love doing them. So yeah. That's, is, there, that's is there a common theme between the universities and the tech companies in terms of what they're actually asking you to address in these talks? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, well, yes, there's common themes, but things have changed. So the original request that I was getting at the beginning so, oh, I should mention, I was doing live talks before this pandemic. So I, I did a TED talk a couple of years ago and it's, it's, so it's sort of built through there. But that talk was developed from the podcast. So that's why I explain it all because it's sort of come together yeah. that way. But um, there's been a change. So before the pandemic, I was like, hey, you know, here's this thing called yoga. Yeah, you've heard of it, but you know, what's the philosophy behind it? Here's some information. This is something called mindfulness. This is how it works for me. Um, and people were like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. You know, wellness category, I'll get to it, that sort of thing. And then mm -hmm. since the podcast or sorry, since the um, pandemic happened, it it sort of formed into we need this now. We need to invest in our teams and we need to give them this resource. And so at the beginning of the pandemic it was like how to deal with change, how to deal with trauma, 
um, like tactics for that, takeaways, like little exercises people can do. And now it's formed into coming out of it. So sort of leading out of this challenging time and looking forward. So it's sort of more leadership focused. So yeah, it's not specific to one group. It's more like I'm watching all of the audiences kind of merge at the same time, if that makes sense. That's pretty incredible that uh, on, you're saying a governmental level, there's been that shift. Um, and so most of the talks that you're doing, is it through a, a government agency, a program, or is this uh, like a solo entrepreneurial uh, endeavor that you've taken on and that you are seeking for your own clients, resources? Um, well, I work with, a, I'm represented by a speakers bureau, but I'm also represented by comedy records and they did my comedy album. They've done a lot of my comedy, uh, like they're like an agency representing a roster of comedians. So they book my talks as well. That's super cool. So that's what you started. It, 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 it was a shift within that agency. They were able to make the transgression into the virtual world. You started off doing live and then moving in the virtual world with them. Yes, exactly. So they were very supportive. I always said they're like, they're just an amazing, ama amazing, uh, amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> they're, amazing. <laughs> uh, they're just like very, very supportive of whatever it is you want to do. So there's a number of different comedians in Canada that work with them. One of them is um, K. Trevor Wilson. So he's on that show Letter Kenny. He's really focused. This is just an example. He's really focused on film and television. So in, his, uh, in addition to his, his stand up, that's his focus. Um, other comedians in the roster are the same, but some are more focused on writing. And for me, I, it was really speaking. So they made an effort to be like, what else do you guys want to be doing? This was even before the pandemic. And then once the pandemic happened, they said, do you, do you guys have any other additional skills that you want to put out into the virtual world? Like, do you do play music, anything that we can translate onto the screen? And so that just kept me, um, uh, encouraged to do more of the talks so that yeah that is really cool so this is your agent as as far as acting also goes um yeah i don't i don't do a ton of acting i i'm not really i'm not really an actress i, I uh or actor i um love to write so i'll submit for shows for writing and stuff like that but yeah not not really acting i'll do it if someone asks me to do it but um yeah, I'm not that good. I know other people out there like you, they're much better. I saw something you were in with Garrett. Garrett's also with Comedy Records and you were in, um, oh. yeah, and, and and you did a wonderful job. That was great. He's a, he's also someone who's gone the film and TV route. So yeah, they've just, they're just really supportive. I know other people, um, yeah, that want to focus more on the writing end. So I do some of that, but then yeah, speaking as well. I guess I just yeah, made an assumption because I've had so many comedian friends who also have agents that rep them for like commercial work or even film and television. Uh, and Garrett, I'm assuming you're talking about um, the James. film Joey Boy. Yeah, which was wonderful. It was so funny. I loved it. Like, or his yeah. character was funny. He, he, I, like, it was so well done. You guys did a great job. Thanks. Thanks for watching it. It was mm -hmm. such a joy to work with him. He was just... So, I mean, the biggest challenge that I had on that project was not corpsing, was not laughing while he, <laughs> it was just like a one day shoot that I, I'm like, okay, don't turn the camera around on me just yet because watching him improvise so much of that and a lot was, I mean, it, um, it was scripted, but his performance in particular, he had such leeway and he was able to improvise such golden moments that had me laughing out loud, which ruined a couple takes, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, that was super fun. And and so the majority of the work that you've done as far as comedy goes is what? Live. Stage live. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll like, like I'll go on tour and stuff like that. I just, I, you know, some people like you probably get a great joy from being on camera and, and, and working from a script. I much prefer the, just the live aspect. So that's why I love doing talks because they're live. I like connecting with the group. And so, yeah, I've just really, I know there's a lot of, like you said, a lot of um, crossover for people who do live performance, they go on on camera as well. I'm not against it, but in terms of where I'm putting my energy and stuff like that, I just much prefer giving a talk or doing a live comedy show. Yeah, are you, go ahead, Justin. Are you still able to get that same sense of feedback and communication with the audiences in the virtual spaces? 
Oh, a good question. So <laughs> for virtual comedy shows, no. <laughs> um, or they can be, <laughs> like, I think it was Garrett actually who said, Garrett's a very good friend of mine, by the way. He was like, a little bit of the comedian dies every time they do a Zoom show. And <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, that, no, that's a hard no on that one. But in terms of giving the talks, it's different. Yeah, giving a talk, I I will probably continue to do virtual and live once we're able to do live things again, aside from the anti-mask rallies. I'm just kidding. Keep mentioning <laughs> that. That's when I'm gonna finally show up. Yeah. <laughs> you guys like share a clip of this. People are just keep hearing me highlighting the anti-mask <laughs> rallies. They just think that's what I'm promoting you here. You ruin your career. I want to promote, okay? Just this. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, so you, no, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so the zoom shows, no for comedy, no, but for the talks, yes, because you don't necessarily expect laughter if you have it great. And I really like to utilize the chat box and it does feel more interactive than in some ways a live talk because in a live talk, they have to wait until the end to ask a question. Whereas I try to encourage like an organic discussion over Zoom so they can type something in. And then when I see it, I can just address it. So do I like it more than live sh talks? No, but uh, I, I, I can see the value in it and I'll probably keep doing them. But as soon as Zoom comedy shows end, that will be the end of those for me. I promise you. <laughs> well, yeah. that, that's what was uh, that was going to be my question with the um, shift of your comedy career because it's been as an actor. I mean, my my work in the comedy realm. I do love being on film and television more so than on this. Well, you know what? That's a lie. I, I love being on stage. It's just, you're flexing such different muscles and it is a very different feedback system. I do miss the immediacy of being able to test out jokes or material, or even just following the fun, playing clowning games in an improv set. Um, but moving into the virtual space, I, maybe because I already work with the film and television aspect like that, that to me made sense. It's like, okay, I, I know how to shift into the virtual space as far as like auditions go. That was already weird enough to have a lot more auditions be virtual rather than being in the room. Because again, it's just a different set of muscles that you're flexing, but even doing this podcast, like the fact that I know Justin's going to have to maybe duck out early a little bit today, but uh, I see one of our regular guests, Frank popped in. And when Justin's not here, Frank is the one who like will send emojis of uh, the the clock to keep me on time because I will talk to you for as long as you let me. And that's, <laughs> no one needs that. <laughs> but I, I don't think that, you just can't have the same kind of, <laughs> sorry, Frank, <laughs> for those who are listening to audio only, uh, Frank says WTOK for time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I I love the fact that things like this, you know, we can present it on screen. <laughs> I just learned that and I'm trying to right now, but in a theater setting, what I love so much about it and what I'm assuming you love about live comedy is the immediacy, the hotness of the energy off of audiences. And like, is that what you, is that what you feed off of? Is that what you miss about it? Yeah, for sure. The, the energy, like I'm a big energy person. I like, I just love picking that up in a room and you know, it's, you can't pick that up on, a, on zoom. Like you, you can't, um, no matter how many, you know, how, applause emojis or whatever like there's no it's not happening uh so yeah i definitely i can appreciate that appreciate it more now that it's gone and will come back i'm sure but right now that is a big part of it um i also miss the writing i i still am doing not writing as much comedy right now as i would like to um because the way you work and write on stage uh, doing stand-up right you're doing a lot of that in front of an audience and working on what's working or what's what's hitting and what's not. So, yeah. And to go back to what you were saying before about how you, you know you love being on camera, I you do sketch and um, improv, right? Or that was sort of that's like your world in the live world. Is that right? 
sketch improv, musical improv, and a little bit of stand up. But yeah, sketch and improv and music were my domains. Right. Because so then that like to me that makes I mean this is getting very niche in the comedy realm. So if anyone who's not uh, into comedy or not no 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 the layers to this level that's totally fine. But from what I've seen, a lot of comedians who do sketch and improv they excel on camera in terms of acting because they have that background. They're used to working in a group sometimes. Uh, whereas with stand up, I, I see a lot of stand ups being in a writer's room. It's not just specific to this, but. Uh, that's one scene, thing I'm seeing a lot, and it's just highlighting people's skills. So yeah, I miss the instant gratification. I miss writing on stage, and those things I'll be very happy to get back to. And yeah, I, I still do some acting. I have done some acting. If someone asks me to do something, I'll do it. But yeah, when in terms of spending my own energy and my own time and creativity on things, it's mostly focusing on comedy and talks. Now, you mentioned energy, and because you also you do some energy work uh, as, you know, uh, uh, speaking about the ego or being a, a yoga professional, I'm curious, sticking in the comedy realm or the acting realm or the performance realm, I, I'm curious as to how you feel about energy when it comes to the give and take in a theater versus, because you've said a couple times that, you know, Yes, I do prefer to do film television work. Um, maybe because the control freak in me is like, I get a couple takes and you know, but it wasn't always written by me or whatever. But um, the energy is a, is a different process I feel, or I'm drained in a different way. And I act like a succubus from other people on set or in the audience and on stage in a different way. What do you feel as far as your writing process goes, either in Zoom round tables now or your um, stand-up comedy uh, and some of the acting work that you have done, do you feel like you get drained in the same way or that you get energized in the same way from those different types of your creative process? Or is that maybe a reason why you like one better than the other? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I think, well, first of all, writing a talk that I can do a lot of it on my own and then just I'll keep working it out the way I work on a stand up set. So I'll, I'll get the, the themes of the things I want to be speaking about um, and I will start delivering it to groups and then figure out how to tailor it. So all of that I can do virtually and it doesn't seem that draining, but it's a lot of work, but it's still going to be a lot of work live, too. Right. So that's no difference there. Um, yeah. In terms of. I love the energy. I actually feel more energized when I'm live and I can work out a comedy set on stage and, and really get that feedback. I don't feel as inspired to work on stand up comedy right now. And so trying to do a, a Zoom show is very fascinating because you can't really get any feedback. You have to like gauge if something's good. And that's not a way that any stand up wants to work. Right. So, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. I energy is is huge for me in every way. I, I practice mindfulness, I practice Reiki, and I teach yoga as well. So it's it's huge for me. I've only, I've only noticed it more in in comedy and giving live talks because of those things. And so anyone who taps in on them, I'm always interested in chatting with them about those types of things because I think it's important to be aware of those of them. You've already uh, triggered so many more questions for me, um, <laughs> and, and it did it did answer my question in certain regards. Okay, I, I also don't want to like chew up all the question time since Justin might have to leave early. Do you have any questions right now, Justin? Yeah, I do. I do need to pop out, guys. I have a puppy that has to go outside, or he's oh, going to be in the house, and I don't want that. Oh, that's okay. It was so nice to meet you, Justin. So nice to chat with you. Too, and I can't wait to catch up when you guys are done and Kaylee sends me the audio file. <laughs> yeah. Have excited. a happy little puppy and um, my apologies in advance for running over to both you and Frank. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Great. <laughs> Crushing it. Hey, bye guys. <laughs> bye. Uh, so my questions from what you just presented are um, right now kind of diverging in two different directions because you were talking about your process as a stand-up comedian and you said that you miss being able to work it out on stage. So first off, I'm curious, you don't 
write out all of your material and rehearse it to like down to the minutia of performance and inflection of every word and in the syntax before you get on stage? Do you just go up with ideas or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the I, in, yeah. So what I've seen with standups over the years is there's kind of two ways. There's pe there's comedians who do that. They write every detail, and those standups I see them as a writer first, and then there's the other kind of uh, standup that's more of a performer first. And so you can kind of see when they're on stage, like if they have this solid writing, and it's so funny. And they're just kind of standing straight and maybe a little bit nervous. Right away, you're like, "Oh, that that's probably a writer." They started as a writer, um, yeah. and then <laughs> if you see another uh, comedian, a lot of the time these types are hosts of shows because they're full of energy and they're just like, "Hey, you know, what's up?" Um, they're a performer first, and so over time you kind of merge the two. And so for me, I've always been a performer first. And so with that, I will take, yeah, concepts, ideas, I'll write out a joke in a certain way and then I'll try it out and then I'll change it. A lot of comedians work like that as well. They'll come off stage and they'll be like, oh, I have to rework this. And then you just keep going. You keep doing the joke over and over until it starts to get laughs at certain points. And then you remove words and phrases as needed. So yeah. yeah that's I think perfect. that's yeah, I think that that's why, um, because I kind of get that sense about you. I've, I've never seen you live on stage performing your stand-up comedy. And God, I, I cannot wait for the day that we can again. Uh, but I, I think that your your energy, I, I that's why maybe I assumed that you were also um, an actor. And, and because you have that performance value that bleeds through. And I'm also just seeing one of the comments here, because uh, we're talking about you as an actor. Frank says that when Hollywood does Blade Runner 2, that you're a shoe in for the young girl Hannah role. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. And Dan here says that you and Steve Martin are going to make a, a Roxanne remake. I would watch all of those. I think you should move into that territory next if I were your <laughs> Perfect. I love these jobs. That's great. They're, these guys are ready to hire me, right? Exactly. That's what this platform is all about. Welcome to HAPS. <laughs> awesome. uh, the other question that I was um, going to diverge into as far as energy work goes, you mentioned that you do Reiki and... I'm, oh, I am insatiably curious as to what that means for you because I've met a couple of, oh, hi, Pablo, Pablo's here. <laughs> I've met a couple of Reiki artists who I've had Reiki done on me and I've had a couple of friends who were close enough to just like over coffee one day be like, I'm getting like uh, this dark blue, almost black energy coming from your throat. What's going on from you? I'm like, oh God, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> oh, it's just, it's a <laughs> different conversation because they sense energy in a different way. So my question for you is, first off, what sort of, I guess, studies or um, work have you done to get to the point to where you are and where are you like what is Reiki to you and, and how do you work it into your energy work or your spiritual work but I'm also curious if it comes in at any time with your performance work like if you just look out in the audience and you see a bunch of blue blobs in people's throats and they're like <laughs> their throat chakras closed <laughs> well I hope you got out what you needed to say when they saw that block there I, I started a podcast <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Um, yeah, so I, I I've just come, I've done a number of different levels in my Reiki. I'm, I'm not quite at my Reiki master yet, so I do it now for loved ones and friends. Right now, I just do mostly distance Reiki, yes. and then I do it on myself um, because of the pandemic. So I do a lot of distance Reiki for people who are ill right now, and that's a big focus for me. I also like to send Reiki to anyone who's having a hard time like mentally physically and you know a lot of people are skeptical about stuff like stuff like reiki i i if, if if anyone's maybe opening their heart to this a little bit more what i would say is the same when you say a prayer for somebody um this is can be thought of in that way you just are setting a good intention and so I, that's a big part of my life and so yes i send it into my yoga classes i like to send reiki into the room before i like to send reiki t through zoom when i teach a virtual yoga class uh, i send it to any talk that i give and i like to send it to the stage so that is to answer your question i'll send it to the stage before i perform and 
a lot of the time the show just goes a little bit better than it may have. And I truly believe that. How can I be the judge? I can't, but I maybe feel more confident and um, I feel like it, that kind of radiates out. And so those are just a couple of things that I do. In terms of my training, I've done my level one, my level two, I've done a number of other healing courses in association with that. And then I still have yet to do my third level, which is my Reiki master. So once, I, once I've done that, then I may do it more regularly, but I don't, I don't think I'll do it as a profession. It's just something I like to do to try and help. And um, yeah, it's, it's helped me pick up the energy in the room at a comedy club almost every time that I perform now. Um, it's just, I can read the room. There's a lot of comedy clubs that uh, got some weird energy in there. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Oh, those green rooms, if they, if those walls yeah. could speak. Yeah. Do so, you, uh, yeah. do Sorry, you do, um, do you have energy, any kind of Reiki that you can do on puppy dogs or did you summon the, I see that Justin's hopping back on, <laughs> he has oh, brought so cute. his puppy for those who are watching. Oh my God. Oh, such a sweetheart. How old is your puppy? Can he hear? Can you hear no. me? Oh yes. Can yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. He's eleven weeks. Oh, sweetheart. He's oh. so cute. That His face. name's Aspen. Oh I love Hi, him. Baby. Hi, buddy. Whenever you whenever you tell me that his name is Aspen, it always reminds me of um how my father would not allow me to name our dog because I wanted to name him Ask Him and <laughs> no one else found it funny. So <laughs> I find it funny. Thank you. No one would let me. Oh my god, that dog's face is so distracting. It looks like it's blood <laughs> blew up in its nose. I love that he's just like he's one of the hosts now. He's the co-host. Yeah, I think for I, I think that uh, here. Hold on. The it's gonna, the show is now going to be mainly about the dog. If I can figure out how to make it about that, as you continue to tell me about Reiki, <laughs> dog. So, Come, buddy. I was going to ask you as far as um, the the energy goes when it comes into your performance work. Um, do you ever, is it something that you can use on yourself? Can you do Reiki on yourself? Do you protect yourself from the weird green room energies that exist in comedy clubs? What? How does that work for you? Yeah, I do it on myself almost every day. Um, one thing that my teacher taught me was that... Uh, you know, when you're trying to send it to other people or give it to other people, it's really important that you do it to yourself first, because yeah, certainly if you're receiving messages or just if you want to be helpful, you want to be able to, you know, the whole saying, you know, you have to be in a position to help yourself before you can help someone else. So it's like that same kind of mentality. So yes. And what kind of like, what does that actually look like? What kind of process do you do on your, do you lie down and put crystals on your whole body? Do you have like a singing bowl? What's your process? So I have crystals and the singing bowl. Yes, those are definitely part of my, uh, <laughs> my stuff, my special stuff, but no, I don't, I don't use those every time I give myself self Reiki. Usually when I wake up in the morning, I'll just um, do it over certain areas of the body, like the eyes, side of the head, throat, uh, back of the head, and then you just kind of move down the body. So you're just working on self reiki in that in that sense. Um, but yeah, since the pandemic, I, you know, you're not wanting to touch anyone, so you can get creative. You can actually do things from a distance, like if someone's in the same room, um, or you can actually do it from another place and send reiki to people. You know, in a hospital, for example, there's lots of people in the hospital right now. So in the morning, sometimes you can use a pillow or a surrogate, or you can just um, yeah, usually I'll use a, a pillow or something like that and just work uh, as if the pillow is a, a surrogate to a person. So it's almost like, uh, and I am not trying, I don't want to put you on the spot as far as um, you're saying like your special tools. I, I have an insane amount of crystals that oh, cool. my original co-host and I got very addicted to when we actually first started this podcast. Uh, so I don't mean to like put you on the spot. I'm actually obsessed with all of this. I have a singing bowl. I have oh, cool. like, you name it. And I have spent at least half of my year's worth of paychecks on that for myself. <laughs> hey, I get it. I get it. It's, but you know what? It's a wonderful thing to invest in. That's my opinion. And that's where it will stay. So. Well, but it sounds like what you're talking about has 
the similarities as far as meditation, mindfulness, awareness goes that you're just using your hands and the awareness of how energy flows, I'm assuming, and either moving them around your own body, placing them on your eyes, your ears, your throat, wherever you feel that energy needs to flow to. But mm -hmm. what's so fascinating and, and maybe... I don't know if you can speak to this from the, I guess, psychological perspective or from the studies that you've done as far as how this energy flow is manifested. It makes me think about, um, I, I, I was talking this morning, I'm on a, I'm a moderator on a panel for a, a online room called the psychology of horror because I've been part of the, genre film industry for quite some time that and and my background academically is psychology and philosophy heavy and and we were talking this morning about the different circuits that are triggered in the brain when it comes to certain recognition or awareness and um, unfortunately we were talking about uh, more of a negative aspect more of uh, we were talking about um, final girls and we were talking about the differentiation between men and women in media the way that they're represented the different uh spectrum of genders and how there was a study that was done wherein subjects were presented with looking at things that were either everyday objects um and then also presented with images of the example that was given was images of women who were considered um in modern times beautiful or uh or, or images of those that didn't seem desirable to the subjects and the circuits in the brain that were being triggered for sub for images of women that were desirable or termed uh, objectified in a sense were actually the same circuits that were being triggered and used for them when they were looked when, when they were presented with images of actual objects so mm -hmm. I'm curious when it comes to the awareness factor for Reiki and for mindfulness did you do any studies as far as I guess neurologically what kind of circuits you're triggering when you're placing your awareness on different parts of the body or flow systems? Is that something that comes into the studies? Um, I would say, what, I mean, mindfulness is quite different. So I, I'd have to speak to each one individually, but in terms of mindfulness, you are, you're watching your mind and you're watching your body. So there's, going to be a lot of triggers that may or may not come up depending on what the mind goes off to and thinks about and then you know how your emotions may or may not re react to those types of things so uh, that all kind of depends on the individual person from my experience obviously society and things like that will play a, uh, a role in that because of how they were where they were raised and that sort of thing um, but yeah I I I, in, in terms of my understanding from mindfulness, I'm, I'm, you, you spit, when I'm doing my practice, I'm watching where my mind goes, I'm watching where my body goes, and I'm watching the movements in the body and reactions from the mind. So yeah, I'm not really sure about certain triggers. I mean, I know my own triggers and I'm aware of when they come up, but through doing my mindfulness practice, I'm able to uh, step outside of them and watch them and then over time they become less of a trigger so yeah so that in terms of mindfulness that's how I would say uh, with mind with with Reiki I don't think it just comes from the brain I think it's I think it's a lot more than that I think it's the spirit the body uh, it, the the energy travels all throughout so yes, for sure, there's neurotransmitters in the brain. If you're doing something like improving negative self-talk, just something like that, you're, you're creating new neural pathways. Um, but yeah, in terms of the definition of Reiki, from my own experience, in terms of the healing work that I do, a lot of it's just come up on its own. Like I'll feel it in my hands when I'm working on someone and I'll feel called to go to a particular area of their body. So yeah, I don't know. In ex my experience, I wouldn't say that was the first thing that came up for me, but 
Yeah. And you're not presenting any other stimuli, any visuals or, um, or are you pre presenting other stimuli like placing when you are able to be in the same room as them? Are you placing crystals? Are you placing something that would be tactile? Um, are you playing auditory, you know, sounds or, or healing crystal bowls of some sort for that kind of stimuli? Uh, yeah, I do use crystals when I feel that they're necessary. If I'm feeling like a blockage in a particular area, then I will include a crystal. I don't use a singing bowl for Reiki. No, that usually that's just for meditation. Um, and oh, sorry, what was the other part of your question? Could you repeat the other part of it? Oh, I was just curious about what different sorts of stimuli you use if you either present, because oh, right. um, we were talking about visual images and how those trigger different I guess, synaptic transactions in the brain. But when it comes to Reiki, um, and I'm very green to understanding what it is, I, mm. I have a better understanding of, I guess, energy work with yoga and just physically going through movements and conditioning your um, habits of practice in the morning. Um, but I'm not super well versed when it comes to energy work with Reiki. So I was curious about the different stimuli, either auditory or visual or tactile that you use. Right. Sorry. That was the other part I, I forgot. So yes, in terms of visualizations, I do bring those into the practice. So if someone has an emotional blockage, so there's physical and emotional. So if they have a physical or an emotional blockage, then I will often walk them through something that's like, I'll say, this is what's coming up for me. This is what I'm sensing. Is there anything that's coming up for you? And a lot of the time it could be an emotional thing that's going on with the person. They mention it. And then I will work on a visualization te technique with them to help them get through it and work through the blockage. So yes, but most of it goes on what that comes up for them. And a lot of the time, I'd say 99% of the time, they already know, like, I'll ask them, is this coming up for you? Are you seeing a person, you know, like what's happening here? And they'll, they'll say, and then we'll kind of go from there. So each session is like, is a little bit organic. And uh, yeah, it's funny. I don't really talk about Reiki that much. I've been talking about it a lot with you uh, <laughs> because, well, because there's a lot of stigma, but it's as a mindfulness practitioner, the creator of Reiki, he was originally a monk. And he got to a certain stage of enlightenment and not all the way, but he got to a certain stage and this was something he was able to take on and teach. So it's a healing practice. It's really not meant for any other reason. So that's the main goal with me when I'm doing it. And that's why, you know, I really focus on things like distance raking and stuff like that right now, because we can't be in the same room, but you can still send people are always like, oh, send positive vibes. This is actually that, right? So uh, yeah. Yeah, you can actually send positive, you can send vibes. And I think we're, we are all sending vibes in one way or another, whether we're conscious of it or not. Um, and we have been talking a lot about Reiki. And I think because it's something that I, I wasn't aware of as part of your repertoire, I knew you more of a stand-up comedian and uh, seeing you around the yoga studio, uh, I, you know, please feel free to shift if you don't want to talk anymore uh, about Reiki. I yeah, it's, it's totally fine. I'm happy to do it. I just, it seems to me there's a lot of uh, apprehension, uh, apprehension around it. And there, but there seems to be more openness to mindfulness. Now those practices are a big part of my life and have been for a number of years now, but I do find it interesting in terms of where everyone in the West is at. And yeah, like yourself, when I first got uh, learned a little bit about Reiki, I was very, very interested, just kind of wanting to learn as much as I could. Um, but yeah, in terms of sharing, I've become a little bit more apprehensive with it because there's been different responses. So that's, that's all I'll say on that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's a valid point. I think that's one of the reasons why I also was curious about starting my own podcast and having conversations about mental health and how it relates to the world of media, because there are, you know, conversations about Reiki are not mainstream and, the more and more that we do create more space for conversations uh, on topics that are more taboo, I think the more we can understand them or wrap our minds around them, even just, you know, the, the comment that I made about the article that we referenced this morning um, in a very different conversation, in a very different way, there was a lot of other context that, you know, we don't have time to get into here. I see that there is a comment from one of our uh, live viewers that says there's no proof that when men look at women 
and objects, they are thinking the same thing. So, th- I, and I absolutely love pushback and I would love to, I, I wish that that could have been part of our conversation this morning. We're not going to use this podcast right now to, to dig into that particular article. Um, and perhaps I shouldn't just make slight tangential or tiny comments about um, something that does deserve a lot more space for that conversation. Because again, not my article, not my research, uh, but it was fascinating to hear about. And I'm just curious to listen to all these different facets and all these different voices that can contribute to a better understanding of these things. So Reiki and the energy work that you do, that is this other side to you that I uh, knew very little about, but I knew that there had to be something else as far as especially ego work goes since you had your own podcast on the sonar network that that you know the titular comment of of ego being in there it's um i i was super grateful seeing some of these podcasts come onto the same network and around the world uh that have to do more about the mental space and creating more conversation for how we keep ourselves healthy mentally, because it's not, that conversation hasn't been given the same amount of airtime, I think, as how we keep ourselves healthy physically. There's an entire industry that is uh, beyond booming. I I don't even know how and where and when it would have, the, the fitness industry and gyms, how they started. I mean, I know the virtual world would do well with a Farrah Fawcett uh, at home video. Was it Farrah Fawcett who did the, the aerobics videos? Suzanne Summers or no, uh, Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda. Thank you. Mm. Uh, and Suzanne Summers and somebody else on uh, body break. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rand McLeod and Hal Johnson. The, that one's wow. a bit local. That's a Canadian, uh, reference yeah Uh, for all the canadian viewers out there i feel like somebody should do a revival of that because in a virtual (laughs) world that would excel but to bring it back to the work that you do um because it is stigmatized uh not just reiki but i think many different conversations that sit under the umbrella of mindfulness and we're we're gonna come close to wrapping up since I, I am noticing the time and uh, <laughs> Justin's not here to write me in, but but I do have one more question before we get to our fun games. Um, when, it, when it comes to this idea of, you know, how even potent, I think, emotionally people might be charged these days, uh, no matter what you're dealing with, you must, and I say you kind of for everybody, I'm assuming every, every emotion must be kind of amplified with what we're going through collectively. It's, I mean, unprecedented times in, in, in our lifetimes. Yes, we can look back to history, but with the work that you're doing, do you feel that that's amplified the, the need or the lean on you? Do you feel, um, does it feel like it's more of a pressure for you? Has it become more challenging in these times? Or do you have a regular enough practice taking care of yourself that you feel fine to always be available to help anybody else whenever they need it? Well, I think, I think no one has that completely figured out. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if they do, I'd love to meet them. Uh, I did. Yeah, I have, I have a practice that I rely on. I will say like mindfulness is the biggest part of my life. That's something I practice every day and it's made a huge change in my life. So that's what's helped me have the capacity to do some of the work that I do. Um, but yeah, there has been more of a call for this kind of work since the pandemic started, but truly I'm grateful for it because I actually felt ready. Like I had put together this, these talks and felt like this is where I want to put my time and my energy. And it's, it happened. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I'm not saying that I was grateful for a pandemic, certainly not, but grateful for the opportunity to try and help people and give them with, give them tools that have worked for me. I I went through a very hard time in my life a number of years ago. My, I went through, I dealt with a death and I went through a divorce and it was all in this kind of two year time frame, And that's what really shifted things for me, learning how to really take care of myself so that I wasn't in a state of trauma all the time, like in this kind of fight or flight stage. And so learning how to do that was huge. It took a while to really build that. And so, yeah, now I'm in a place where I feel better 
feel that I can, I am equipped to, to, to speak about it and help people, but I got to keep working at it. And, and it's my mindfulness teacher. He says, it's like, you're going, when you're going, uh, when you're working on your practice, doing your practice every day, you're going upstream. And so you're going against the grain, but there's great benefits from it. And then as soon as you fall out of it, you're going downstream again. So you have to, you have to work at it. So I have to keep working at it just like everyone else. And I know that um, like Mr. Rogers, I remember the Mr. Rogers, I'm not sure if it was in the documentary or in his, um, in his movie with Tom Hanks. I can't remember. But anyway, I remember someone asking about how he's always so, you know, how do you help and help children? And you're so chipper. And his wife was like, he goes into the pool and he swims every day. Like he needs to do that. He still needs to process his emotions. Right. So we all have to do that. And so, yes, I've seen a shift and yeah, I got to keep working at my own stuff too, for sure. Well, I was assuming that you're like superwoman and, and just works like a machine because <laughs> that, I, I've only ever seen such a, such a positive vibe from you. And oh, thank you. Same to you. Same to you. Well, thank you. That's why I was also curious because I hear that about myself and I, I, I guess my own identity, I'm like, oh my God, maybe I just don't show my crumpled crying mess of self. Uh, the times where I am just, on my yoga mat, not doing yoga, just dropping tears. And I'm like, this is good. Like it feels, it's a good, well, sometimes it doesn't feel great, but it did make me think of, um, before we hopped on, I was reading Carl Jung and, um, you know, prepping what my understanding of the ego was, but also cause I'm obsessed with Carl Jung, mm -hmm. anything that's psychoanalytical. And the idea that he said, there's a quote that says the perfect has no need of the other. Um, Oh, my computer's about to die. Hold on. There we are. So he says that there, the perfect has no need of the other. And having conversations with friends who have been in similar boats and moving into the virtual world and dealing with pandemics and dealing with losses to death and separation and isolation, um, we've been having these constant conversations about what what it means to disconnect and uh, take care of yourself. And uh, that's one of the reasons why Justin and I decided to take a pause at the beginning of the pandemic, because there were a lot of other aspects in our lives that got hit hard. Um, but we continued to see a lot of posts on Instagram that seemed like they were still fitting with the showing the best side of yourself. And that's something that I continually think about, you know, how to ensure whatever I do share is still somehow contributing to maybe pushing the needle towards something that feels more joyful, but not in a sense that overshadows reality or doesn't show that life has both sides. So it's very, I, I love learning more about the kind of work that you do. Uh, and, and I'm going to be good, even though Justin's gone and now try to bring it around to some of the games that we play on here to bring it to, uh, to our clothes soon. So we play two truths and a lie often on here and you've prepared your own, you have yours ready to, to read, right? Yes. I do. Okay. Um, if you wouldn't mind, oh, actually I'll type them out and put them in the chat for anybody who wants to also uh, guess, but go ahead and tell us what these three things are and we're going to guess which one is the lie. Okay. So here they are. Um, I speak fluent Italian. I toured across Europe doing children's theater. And my favorite country I visited is Portugal. Okay. Speak fluent Italian. You toured across Europe doing children's theater. I mean, knowing some of your background, I feel like I'm going to have to readily accept number two. <laughs> and your favorite country that you have traveled to, you said? Yes is Portugal. I mean, I don't know where else you traveled to. And Canada's pretty cool, but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's not like you travel there, you live there. My, I'm gonna put these in the chat for people. If anybody who is watching live wants to try to guess which one is the lie. Um, I think I already have I think I have my guess. Okay. 
normally this is where I lean on Justin and make him guess first so that I can change my answer. <laughs> <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> All right. Well, the, the 141 people who are eyeballing are not saying anything yet. So that's pressure on me. I'm going to say, I'm going to say that Portugal is not your favorite country that you've traveled to because it seems the easiest to tweak. <laughs> yeah. and mind you, I have never heard you speak Italian and I don't hear an accent, but I'm not great with accents. <laughs> All right. You're going to have to give us the answer now. You're right. That was right. I okay. Should... Well then where is Canada? Canada is your favorite. I actually haven't been to Portugal. Um, oh, yeah. well, I, I guessed, but it wasn't for the right lie. <laughs> <laughs> I still assumed that you could be there. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, I want to go. I'm dying to go, but I haven't been there. Where um, have you been? What is your favorite place that you have been to? Oh, um, probably New Zealand. It's so beautiful there. Uh, but I, I actually used to live in Italy, and I did do the children's theater there. So I do speak the language. But yeah, I never got a chance to get over to Portugal. So that's on my list. It just looks stunning. I'm dying to go. Uh, but yeah, so probably New Zealand or maybe Indonesia. Those are probably two places I've loved. Just beautiful. Did you, were, were you over there for any kind of work? Um, were you in Indonesia doing any kind of energy work? Oh, no. This was like, uh, how many years ago now? 10 years or so. I just was just backpacking. Um, in Italy, I was working there, so I was doing the children's theater. I was actually basically felt like a carny, like I was just touring around in a tiny clown car. Would not recommend for various reasons, uh, <laughs> but that was uh, a couple of years after the time in, in Italy doing that. Um, but yeah, no, backpacking across um, Indonesia and then New Zealand. I, well, yeah, New Zealand, I was emceeing a wedding, so that's what that was for. Oh, wow. I mean, just talking about travel in general is making me nostalgic and jealous. I have Italy on, uh, it's near the top of my list of where I still want to go visit. I can't believe I still have not been there. Then again, I'm also kind of surprised that I still have not yet visited my sister in, in her new place over in, in England. She oh, wow. she moves around just as, as much as me. For me, I move around Toronto right. <laughs> every couple of months. Right. And she moves around Europe, <laughs> which is much classier and, and uh, worldly, we'll say. But uh, that's, she, cool. that, that's really cool. I, you'll It'll be easy to get over to Italy when you do go visit her because it's super cheap. I mean, this is all like to fly. It'll be not very expensive at all. So you can definitely tack that on. Yeah, I'm super excited. I, I cannot wait until I can. What's funny is that I, I came very close to doing just that and getting locked down over there. I had There was a friend who um, was in Budapest at the time and then w got trapped on the island of Malta. And I was so close to just hopping on a plane and, and, and going over. Because my sister at the time, I was supposed to visit her, but things started shaking down over there and we were starting to see... Um, they, just the complications that were arising from the onslaught of the pandemic that she's like, I'm not sure if this is a good time. So I'm like, that's cool. I'll just like go hang out in Malta and wait until you're ready. I would have been locked down for quite oh, a yeah, I mean, you were smart to come back, but you, who knows? Who knew at that time, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You made the right call for sure. That's the thing. It's so strange to think that, that I had literally just come back from, I was lucky I was in LA right beforehand. So I, I made it back to Canada and then kind of just got stuck in the right place. Um, I feel safe being here, but I miss traveling and that puts, that puts it back in my mind. <laughs> Me too. I, I miss it a ton. And I feel like we're all going to be so appreciative of things after this, you know, like just so much more, just hanging out with a couple of friends or just, just going to feel different. So I look forward to that. That'll be nice. Yeah. Well, having your energy on this podcast has been absolutely beautiful. Uh, it does help me kind of segue into my one cool thing. So I'll yeah. share my one cool thing first and then I'll have you go. But um, especially because I've been in just such, I've been very aware of my energy and um, I guess hyper attentive to my moods uh, probably a little bit too much. Sometimes I get stuck there being like, well, well, why, why can't I snap myself out of it? But what did help me snap out of it, I wonder if I can add this, um, 
with, there we go. I got an image that I'm bringing in uh, that hopefully I can make full screen for those who, there we go. This is literally what, uh, this is more of a forewarning, not just a one cool thing, but what I'm showing on screen right now for our audio only listeners is what I will be sending to anybody who tries to email me, I think for the rest of at least this week, because I'm just, this is how I feel. Uh, my cousin sent me this, this, you know, what is this? A gif, a gif, a, a meme. Anyway, <laughs> picture of a girl on and she's crying onto her pictures and it says some days I just want to reply to emails with okay and this photo so please everyone consider yourself forewarned that this is now what you'll be getting if you try to email me um that's that's cute I like it and now me trying to figure out how to like stop showing it uh <laughs> guys so that is for this week and um for the rest of my pandemic days my computer i don't know if it's gonna last but we're gonna try this anyway i'll show you what i have been doing to keep myself i don't know somewhat sane i have <laughs> an herb garden that i've started Ooh. and instead, like of, instead of having um my picture frames on walls now <laughs> they are the placemats for my herbs and the water that falls out of them so those are my i love i love anyone anyone who gets into the green thumb stuff i love hearing about that that looks awesome well mm -hmm. i definitely have greens but my thumbs are probably not the best mothers to them so it's a lot of phone calls to my mom being like Can <laughs> plant this onion well i have an onion tree and she just sends back <laughs> word tree with a question mark and laughs at me for the rest of the day. <laughs> <That's That's awesome. laughs> All right. What about you? What's your one cool thing? Um, okay. So I, I practice mindfulness as I've mentioned. So a lot of people ask me how to practice. And um, so I thought I would share it with you. You may or may not already know. I know, I know you meditate every day. Um, mindfulness, a little bit different. One thing that I love to try and do in my practice is I try to incorporate it into a daily task. So it's a really good place to start for anybody who's like, yeah, I don't really know what it is. I want to try it and I don't really want to do a seated practice. So um, what you can do is I like to do something called a mindful shower. And hopefully people are going to do that anyway. Like I know it's getting sunny out, so there's a reason to do it. Uh, but what you're going to do is you just, when you're coming into the washroom or whatever, you just set the goal that you're going to have a mindful shower and then you use the task. So the task of having a shower as your home base. So similar to a, a mindfulness seated practice, you have, may have a mantra or you may use your breath as your home base that you come back to and you watch that your mind go out and then you guide it back to your breath or your mantra, your word that you like. So in this case, you're doing it with your shower. So you're just going to count how many times you're guiding your mind back to the task of having a shower. So turning on the faucet, I'm here. Let the mind go off. It's going to think about all kinds of stuff, reality TV or whatever, grocery list, whatever it is, let it go off and then just guide it back. And then if you could count in that time period, if it's 10 minutes, how many times you did that, you're doing it. That's practicing mindfulness. So a lot of people are like, I don't know how where to start. That's where I suggest. It's good to go with a task that's like somewhat monotonous, like folding laundry just to start or, um, you know, cooking as long as you just, that's the only thing you're doing. You're not listening to anything. You're just cooking and then coming back to the task of cooking. So yeah, it's just basically practicing mindfulness in daily life. You start to wake up your mind that way, which is nice. So That's a beautiful reminder. That's probably exactly what I needed to hear because it's so true that the meditation practice, especially if you're doing the same thing every day, mm -hmm. if you get too used to it, it's same thing as I, I feel like when you go to the gym, it's like every day is leg day. Nobody, nobody wants that. So right. <laughs> being able to change it up so that it has some sort of a uh, um, newness and you're not just not even aware anymore, because that's what has been happening to me in my morning practice where I'm like, Oh, the timer went off and my mind was everywhere, but, but nowhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was lost in thought, which, which happens, right? So that's the, the more you start to do it, you kind of catch the mind when it goes off in thought. And that's why some people like to do a seated practice with a bell or something that it just every couple minutes, it rings the bell 
and then you it wakes you up out of it and then you come back to your practice so that's why using a home a daily practice at home is a like a daily task is a good way to do it because you're like oh where'd my mind go it went off to a million things i'm folding this sock i'm guiding it back so yeah that would be one thing that works for me that i do a lot I'm going to have to hit pause on all my other podcasts when I fold laundry now. I'm always <laughs> to things. This is, uh, yep, the reminder that I needed to hear. <laughs> For sure. And that's the thing, right? Like we are so heavily simulated right now. Like that's just where we're at. And so you kind of do have to take a moment to be like, I'm just going to go for a walk. That's it. Maybe you have your pet with you, but you're not listening to something, you're not distracted with the phone, you're just focusing on that task, which is hard, you know? A hundred years ago, that was easy, but now, or not easy, but it was life, right? Now we have so many distractions, so, yeah. Yeah, that has served me well. I've forced myself to just start having my first morning coffee when it's, uh, the climate is somewhat agreeable because let's face it, Canada is not always the greatest that I've been having to like put a parka on or my winter jacket again, but make my first morning coffee one that I just walk around the block with. It's yeah. Changing up the routine has been uh, very, very nice. And even taking different routes has been helpful. Not just doing the same one every morning. Yeah, totally. You got to switch it up. Otherwise we go nuts. Yeah. We go totally nuts. <laughs> well, you can't go where you're coming from, but I yeah. have been so Grateful to have you on this podcast. Thank you so much. I'm hoping that maybe we're going to be able to have you back again someday um, and that we can still point people to go back and listen to other episodes that you have done with your uh, ego podcast on the Sonar Network because those still yeah. live online for people to listen to. Yeah, and they're timeless. Like a lot of it's just getting other people's um, takes on what's working for them. So a lot of people are like, yeah, I want to take care of myself, but I need to do some research on what to do. So it's a good database for that. If you're like, what's going to work for me in my wellness practice, but thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. It's so nice to talk to you. It's nice to talk to you too. It's nice to just see you again. <laughs> you, too. you too. Totally. It's been like way too long because of this pandemic. I know. I don't even know how to count this. Like when you were saying that it's been 10 years since you had traveled, I'm like, yeah, but that also doesn't include, like, this just hasn't been a year. It hasn't. Right. Been, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, yeah, I, it's been a year and forever now. It's uh, people are like before times, you know, like whenever you see something from 2019, you're just like, oh, those were the days. <laughs> That's when we were living. We'll, yeah. we'll get back to it. We'll get back to it. It may take a little while, but we're going to get back to it. I saw a little rock on my walk today that had a child. Well, I'm assuming a child. Um, so so categorical of me to assume like a parent or an adult didn't have this kind of skill, but it's beautifully painted with the word hope on it. And I'm like, that's a child's work for sure. That was a 62 year old man. That's who that was. He got yeah. down on the knees and he got, no, you're probably right. Yeah. It was, I mean, he is God's child. And he there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Um, actually, before you go, where can people find you? Where can they follow you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, my website is just my name, D-E-N-A jackson.ca. And my Twitter and Instagram and all that is at Dina Talks, D-E-N-A-T-A-L-K-S. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. and that will be in the show notes for everybody too. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our live watchers and to anybody who's listening to it afterwards. Everybody have a good rest of your day. Maybe go for a walk. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. If you like this podcast, you can support it by subscribing to it on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also leave us a rating or review, which sincerely helps us and we absolutely love. Come hang out with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and send us your questions, recommendations, and cool things at we're totally not okay at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to We're Totally Not Okay, but that's okay. <laughs>